everyone. My name is Olivia Rayner. I am the director of the Tarjan Center here at UCLA. Uh, we are the University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities here in California. And on behalf of the Tarjan Center, uh, CART, the Center for Autism Research and Treatment, and the IDDRC, the Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Research Center, I want to welcome you to the Tarjan Center Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome our distinguished speaker, uh, Dr. Brandon Ito. Uh, Dr. Ito uh, completed his undergraduate degree in human development with minors in psychology, healthcare, and social issues from the University of California, San Diego. He completed his medical training at the University of California, Irvine School of Medicine, and obtained a master's degree from Harvard University in Public Health. Dr. Ito completed his adult psychiatry training at the University of California, San Francisco, where he was a global health clinical scholar and graduated with an area of distinct, distinction in LGD, LGBT uh, mental health. He completed his child and adolescent psychiatry fellowship at uh, New York University Bellevue Hospital, where he served as chief fellow. Dr. Ido is interested in medical education and teaching LGBTQ and mental health and reducing health care disparities, disparities. He is completing his second year as a UCLA Medical Education Fellow and serves as the psychiatry clerkship chair in the UCLA School of Medicine. His clinical roles include being a supervisor in the CAN Clinic, Behavioral Wellness Center, and the UCLA Gender Health Program. Today, he will be presenting what promises to be a fascinating and informative lecture on correlations and controversies, gender dysphoria and autism spectrum disorders. Please welcome me, welcome, uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Brandon. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Can everybody hear me okay? If I use, I don't know if I need to use this microphone. I'll point it towards me. Um, I was really impressed by the energy that you guys brought into this room. Um, just before I start, how many of you guys are clinicians in here? So how many of you work directly either with individuals who have autism, individuals who have gender dysphoria? OK, so a good amount. Um, I want to be able to use this time to start a conversation about some of the literature that's been recently published about an overlap between diagnoses of gender dysphoria and autism spectrum disorder. Um, by no means is the literature clear, but I want each of you, especially those who work closely with families and children in this population, to be to be abreast of the literature that's out there um, because families and families will be looking to each of us to provide them some answers. So first, I wanted to start with disclosures. So I have no financial disclosures. However, I'd also like to disclose that I identify as an adult, a neurotypical, and a cisgender male. Uh, the reason why I think this is important, particularly with this lecture, is because anytime any of us are looked at as authoritative voices, expert in a field about a community, or about communities to which we don't belong, there are inherent risks in furthering, pathologizing, stigmatizing already vulnerable populations. So I'd like to give and present this data with this um, also in mind. In terms of my objectives, so I'm going to be describing some of the current literature, describing the overlap between the two diagnoses, introduce some theoretical frameworks that have been put out there to describe a phenomenology that uh, clinicians have been observing. I want to also discuss the state of controversy around the current literature um, and also get your thoughts on it as well. And my goal ultimately is to provide a background for further research and interventions, particularly um, in, like I said, in this vulnerable population um, who may or may not be interacting with the healthcare system currently. Um, because of the limited access and or information. So if, you, if any of you do a quick Google search on 
the link between gender dysphoria and autism spectrum disorders, you are going to come up with a number of recent articles um, talking about this connection. So this one's from Forbes magazine. Uh, there's growing evidence for a link between gender dysphoria and autism spectrum disorders. Another one from The Atlantic, the link between autism and trans identity. Um, this is another one from a publication called The National Review. Um, I will say that they have a more conservative uh, bent. The title of their article was The Quote Trans Child as Experimental Guinea Pig. And another article which was published just in November of 2018, Autistic Children Pushed to Become Transgender. So if we look closer into this article, um, it quotes, most of the youngsters undergoing the transformation are autistic. According to a teacher there who said vulnerable children with mental health problems were being tricked into believing that they are the wrong sex. The reason I put these out there is because if, if we as providers don't offer this information, families are going to look and find this information somewhere. Typically, it comes from newspaper articles, the internet, and there's a lot of misrepresented data out there, um, which is why I think we need to do, be discussing it here. So in order for us to be speaking on the same page, I just wanted to give a simple graphic about the components of gender identity that I will be using throughout the talk. So the first is sex, um, which generally, uh, generally talks about the biological indicators of either being male or female. Examples of these which include chromosomes, so X, Y. The next component is the gender role, and these are socially created roles of males and females. We know that the, the idea of gender roles within our society is ingrained very, very early on in development. So children by the age of three have a pretty firm sense of what it means to be a male or what it means to be a female. Um, and even when we look at really, really early developmental videos, we know that if you take the same child um, that generally looks a gender, a newborn, and dress it up in either pink or blue, the way that people and adults interact with that child is very, very different. So if the child is dressed in blue, the child tends to be handled more roughly, um, picked up more often. Um, if the child is dressed in pink, they are more coddled, they are spoken to more directly. So these types of uh, engendered uh, behaviors are pretty much pervasive from, from birth. Another overlapping component is gender expression. So this is the publicly lived role as male or female. All of these intersect in the middle to comprise what we describe as gender identity. So someone's internal sense of whether they are male or female. Overlapping all of this in a somewhat confusing way is sexual orientation, which is related but not directly a part of gender identity. Another way to look at this overlap is to use uh, Jay Bruin, thank you UCLA, um, which breaks down sex assigned at birth, gender identity, gender expression, and sexual or romantic attraction along a spectrum from, so if we take gender identity for example, from an individual who identifies as agender or without agender, all the way to man, woman, um, and other categories such as gender queer or gender non-binary. Um, this also includes uh, another example of sexual orientation. So somebody may be attracted to both um, genders, one gender versus the other, um, or not attracted to any genders at all. All right, and just to go through some of the definitions, I know that this is kind of the dull part, but so again, sex is the definition of biological indicators of male, female, gender, the public lived role is a male or female, or male, female, man or woman, gender assignment, so this is the initial assignment typically made at birth about whether a child is male or female. Um, how is this assignment typically made? Yes, genital. So what happens is when children are born, uh, physicians typically take a look at the genitals and then assign whether that person is male or female. Um, this 
This issue is particularly complex for individuals who identify as intersex or maybe have genitalia that is ambiguously male, ambiguous and not male or female. Um, because oftentimes in the past, they would choose the gender based on what the genitalia most look like, which may not have matched the child's later gender identity. All right, so we went over gender role, which are the socially created roles, gender identity. Cisgender is a word that you may hear very frequently. So these are individuals who identify with their assigned gender. So my assigned gender at birth was male. I identify as male. So therefore, I fall under the category of cisgender. This is opposed to the definition of transgender, which is individuals who identify with a gender different than their assigned gender at birth. And then it leads us to the diagnostic category of gender dysphoria, in which an individual has a affective or cognitive disconnect or discontent with their assigned gender at birth and importantly, one that causes impairment or distress. Okay. I want to look at the, the criteria and the definitions for gender dysphoria in children <coughs> briefly, just to give everybody a background about how this diagnosis is made. Um, so this is again from the DSM-5. So in order to meet criteria for gender dysphoria in children, there must be a difference between one experienced gender and assigned gender, it must include a strong desire to be or insistence that they are the other gender. A strong preference for wearing clothing typical of the other gender. A strong preference for cross-gender play. A strong preference for toys, games, and activities of the other gender a strong rejection of toys, games, activities of the assigned gender, strong preference for playmates of the other, agenda, other gender, strong dislike of one's sexual anatomy, and also a strong desire for the physical sex characteristics um, that match one's experienced gender. So that includes um, having a penis, having a vagina, having breasts, um, in order to meet full criteria, so you need six of eight criteria for at least six months in order to meet the diagnostic criteria for gender dysphoria. In adults and adolescents, the criteria is a little less stringent. So in order to meet full diagnostic criteria, you would need to meet two, or, two of six of the di uh, symptoms for at least six months. So again, similarly, there's a marked incongruence. a strong desire to be rid of primary or secondary sex characteristics. So those include body hair, facial hair, breasts. A strong desire for the primary second, secondary sex characteristics of the other gender. Strong desire to be the other gender. Desire to be treated as the other gender. And a strong conviction that one has the typical feelings and reactions of the other gender. Is there any questions so far? Why are the differences so like, drastic, I guess, from like being a child to adolescent? Does that get into more like social um, the I haven't read explicitly why they, they made it such a higher criteria. My guess is that because, um, because they are trying to be more specific, in the diagnosis in children, they basically made a higher threshold. Um, so that in order to meet it as a child and not an adolescent, you just need to meet more of the criteria. That's my guess. Are there two different communities? No? Because I think the child oh, that's a good question. the five were more obsessive than that. They're, they're more developmental and more detailed, so it could be. That's, that's also probably <laughs> true. That's a good question. I don't know if there were two different committees. I would hope that oh, I would hope so. Um, so I'm going to put up real quickly the. Can I ask you a question? Yes. So the discussion of at what point do you diagnose? Where is their dysfunction? Where is their dysfunction? Oh, 
all of these need to meet impairment. Okay. Or I guess all of these have to cause dis um, impairment or distress. I think so that was your question. question. What would be indicative of the distress or impairment? Good question. I've, I think I'm going to hold that till the end and come back to that question. Um, just quickly, I'm going to put up the core symptoms of ASD, or the diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, primarily to, to have them on the board and think about them, especially in the context of the criteria we just looked at in terms of gender dysphoria. Um, so you can see that some of, these, some of these symptoms may overlap with some of the criteria in gender dysphoria, which makes this particular topic so tricky. So if you can imagine, um, highly restricted interests. So if a child has a highly restricted interest, say they are male assigned, and they have a highly restricted interest in terms of dolls or Barbies or um, toys that have long hair, um, that technically could overlap and meet a criteria for one of the criteria for gender dysphoria. Is that clear? Um, so we'll be talking about some of the ways that these um, overlap and cause some confusion in the literature a little bit later. So some of the diagnostics include, basically there's huge heterogeneity and anybody who's worked with anybody who has been diagnosed with autism, anybody who's been diagnosed with gender dysphoria, you know that one individual is completely different than the next individual you see. Um, Again, differentiating between core symptoms, restricted interest, repetitive play, um, for, of ASD with co-occurring diagnoses. Um, another diagnostic issue is that gender variance, gender identity, and ambiguity is really, really, really difficult for teens who don't have autism to describe very clearly. Um, what we are trying to understand and differentiate is what makes somebody just different or outside of a predicted norm versus someone who has a core cross-gender identity. All right, some screening items that are used within this population. So the most common one that we've seen in the literature is the GIDQYAA. It's a 27-point questionnaire with pretty good specificity and sensitivity, um, which asks questions such as, in the past 12 months, have you felt uncertain about your gender, that is, feeling somewhere between a man or a woman? Um, this is the screening tool that we use with um, our patients in the gender health program. An alternative scale is the Utrecht gender dysphoria scale. This is most commonly used in uh, European literature, which is a 12-item scale with, again, good sensitivity and specificity, which asks questions such as, I feel unhappy because I have to behave like a boy or a girl. Every time someone treats me like a boy or a girl, I feel hurt. <coughs> All right, so let's start getting into some of the literature. Um, in the, the current literature, the overlap or the co-occurrence of gender dysphoria and ASD has been quoted as anywhere between 6% to 12.3% of gender-referred youth. So if we think about gender dysphoria occurring in 1 to 10,000 to 50,000 individuals, and autism occurring on the, on the high end in 1 out of every 50 to the low end of 1 in 500 individuals, the occurrence of both of these diagnoses occurring together should be extremely rare. Um, other quoted statistics that we see very commonly are that children with autism are 7.6 times more likely to wish that they are the opposite sex. Um, and individuals with autism report a higher number of gender dysphoric traits um, on the scales, one of which I, I showed earlier, the GIDYQ. So individuals who have diagnoses of autism report more uh, traits consistent with the diagnosis of gender dysphoria than the general population. A lot of the early studies came out of a, uh, a, a very specialized gender clinic, which is located in the Netherlands. Um, and published by DeVries et al. in 2010, in which they took 204 children and adolescents, 
and interview these children using the DISCO-10. They assess their gender identity both at intake and a year apart. And what they found was that children aged 7 to 10 years old had a pretty high rate of uh, diagnoses of both gender identity disorder, which is DSM-4, and autism, so 6.4%. Um, the number of children who are diagnosed with a diagnosis of gender identity disorder not otherwise specified and autism spectrum disorder was 13%. So again, these are really, really high percentages. What I think is important to note is A, uh, the overlap between the diagnoses was much, much higher than anticipated. And also, specifically in this population, six out of seven with gender identity disorder in this study did not persist with a tra transgender identity into adulthood or a year later. Does that make sense? When they looked at the adolescent population, um, what they found, again, the overlap between gender identity disorder and autism was really high, 6.5%. The GID NOS <laughs> and ASD was 37.5%. Um, interestingly, there was a much higher rate of persistence. So 78% versus, somebody do the math, one out of, one out of seven in the child population, okay? Um, this is where we get, the, we get the statistic that the combined prevalence of gender dysphoria and autism is around 8%. So, this is the study that, that first brought up that statistic on a, on a clinic population level. Again, the, the important thing I think to me clinically is the much higher rate of persistence once we get into the adolescent years versus the children who were seen at a much younger age. Um, the glaring limitation, which the authors both pointed out and which, which other researchers have pointed out in the field, is that this diagnosis of gender identity disorder not otherwise specified, and for those of you clinicians who worked under the DSM-4, this NOS kind of became a, a catch-all category of everything that didn't really fit nicely into a category. So contained within this GID NOS category were children who had symptoms that were subthreshold atypical or unrealistic. So for example, if a child had autism and say preferred playing with glitter or had long hair or had strong beliefs about estrogen, these, would, these children would be diagnosed with GID NOS. So in some ways, when we look at this percentage of 37.5% having both, um, in some ways we can think of that as perhaps an inflated statistic. And the disco is super broad. So it would diagnose, you know, I think probably the specificity is like 60, 70 percent with people with lower IQs, with learning disabilities, with high anxiety. It's like if you have some, I mean, it's beyond PDD NOS, I would say. I'm so you sort of got that. I'm trying to, to look at whether I wrote. I don't have the, the numbers on that one. Um, OK, so when we look at the other studies that, that have looked at the overlap between these diagnoses, so in individuals with diagnosed gender dysphoria, um, in these populations, they, they have been given screening tools. So one study looking at adults given the autism quotient, there was an overlap of 5.5%. Um, when using the SRS in children, the overlap between the diagnosis was, seen, was um, published to be 54% with 27% of, of the children in the severe range of autism traits. Again, with the Asperger syndrome diagnostic scale, the a ASDS, um, the overlap between the diagnoses is 23%. So again, these are numbers that are way, way higher than anticipated. Some researchers have looked the opposite way and have looked at in individuals who have been diagnosed with autism, 
what is the pre what is the prevalence of uh, gender dysphoric traits? Um, so. Many of the studies have used the CBCL as a way to categorize the overlap with a prevalence of 0.5 to 5%. Um, and in individuals with autism on self-reported scales, 3.8% have reported um, symptoms consistent with gender dysphoria. So looking at the overlap in multiple different ways, using multiple different tools, there does seem to be an elevated overlap than what would be predicted. Um, based on the literature. All right, just a quick note on sexual identity. Um, I, I know this isn't focused on sexual identity, but there's a point at the end that I think is relevant, uh, which is, in general, when, when there have been studies uh, looking at how do individuals with autism identify their own sexual orientations, what, what's come out of these qualitative and quantitative studies is that individuals with ASD are just more tolerable of sexual minority orientations. They're less rigidly adhered to either being categorized as gay or straight. Um, they're more likely to identify as asexual. The reason why I think this is important is because in some individuals with autism, sexual orientation may be correlated with their sense of gender identity. So another way to say this is, for some individuals, um, being a assigned male attracted to a male may be related to thoughts about that their thoughts about their gender identity being female. Does that make sense? So instead of necessarily being able to say, well, I am a male that is attracted to a male, so I can be gay or I am gay, it may be tied into thoughts of, well, maybe that means that I am a woman or part of my identity is female. This might represent a unique risk factor because in, the, in some of the studies looking at the overlap, a higher percentage of individuals with autism take on a, I'm gonna have to be, I'm gonna have to have to think about this every time because the literature switches this. So in individuals with autism, there is a high percentage of individuals who identify with a heterosexual identity, a sexual orientation, meaning that if somebody is a natal male, and they have a identity as a trans female, they are more likely to identify their sexual orientation as heterosexual, meaning that they are interested in males. Okay? This, is, this may be a unique risk factor because we know that in follow-up studies with individuals who have gone through either hormone therapy or gone through um, uh, gender affirmation surgeries, that those individuals um, who have a heterosexual orientation are more likely than others to express regret or dis dissatisfaction with their treatment, with their post-surgical treatment. Just to put this in graph form, so we see here, just to look at the top two, so these are the males and females who have been diagnosed with autism. We just see a lot more variance in terms of their identified sexual orientations. And similarly, when we look at gender, ide gender identity, so the, the categories being man, transgender, bigendered, cross-dresser, genderqueer, other, or woman, we just see a lot more variance also in, in gender identity as well. All right, so some, some of the theories that have been put out there to try to describe and capture this phenomenology that we are seeing um, rely on uh, a, few, a few background theories. So one of them is this biological theory. This sort of is an extension of the extreme male brain hypothesis of autism in which increased antenatal exposure to testosterone masculinizes the brain in autistic youth. Um, there is some data to suggest that in trans men, so natal females who identify as trans men, um, have AQ scores which are higher than than other natal females. 
Um, there's also a lot of similarities in terms of behaviors between females with autism and trans men with gender dysphoria. So some of the similarities include females with autism and trans men are more likely to have cross-sex typical play. They're uh, more often to score lower on scales of empathy and social skills. Handedness patterns, increased prevalence of homosexuality and bisexuality. So again, this is kind of categorized under this extreme male brain or, or maleness hypothesis. Um, other biological factors that have been coming out in the literature, so one of them, high birth weight, has been associated with both um, high gender non-conforming behaviors and also ASD traits. And then recently, uh, with a, one of the authors who was actually here at UCLA, um, genetic influences have been looked at with a higher rate of gender dysphoria among twin sibling pairs, and also looking at this, uh, so there was a paper published in February of this year where they looked at the association between gender dysphoria and genes involved in sex hormone signaling. And what they found was that um, individuals with, do I have any geneticists in the room? Okay, you may understand this. So, <laughs> ERA, SRD5A2, and STS alleles um, were basically associated with individuals who um, had gender dysphoria. Another one, AR, was also one of the uh, gene points that was signaled out. So the important point of this being that these genes are thought to be important in regulating sex hormone signaling, both masculinizing and feminizing, which were increased in the population of individuals who identified as transgender. So there may be some genetic influences that, that are that we'll see coming up in the literature. Can I ask you, do you know, do you know whether these uh, participants, gender participants, were homosexual or heterosexual related to the first science? So in other words, that could be related to homosexuality rather than the gene? This one? Yeah. Possibly. I don't know. Um, they may have broken it down um, in the paper, but I don't know it off the top of my head. All right, so other, other theories that have been out there, um, so social theories. So gender and the idea and the expression of gender is basically learned from our environment. We talked about how social roles and the social environment is so important in imprinting and reinforcing these rules. Um, one theory has that been that individuals who have autism have deficits in theory of mind, which impacts their gender development in relation to others. Um, in other words, they, it is saying that because I have difficulty understanding the perceptions of others, my gender identity is more fluid because I'm not as responsive to the social feedback. Okay. Um, gender dysphoria increases with increased um, AQ scores. And we also, another theory is that gender nonconforming youth are often bullied, which could impact their, their social development. Um, a alternative theory that's been put out there recently, especially, is that having a trans identity may help individuals with autism explain their difference. So if people grow, if individuals grow up, having a sense that something is different from their peers, um, having a trans identity may be one way to explain that feeling of difference. This is also a, a way in which individuals connect and create communities. Um, friendships, relationships, activities, etc. Um, so this may also be somewhat contributing to the overlap. Cognitive theories. Um, so children with profound cognitive deficits have more difficulty articulating a consistent gender identity. Um, they may speak with less depth about their concept of themselves as a boy or a girl. Um, individuals with autism may also have cognitive rigidity and intolerance with ambiguity. So this is what we sometimes think of as black or white concrete thinking. So that gender exists either as a male or female. So if I am assigned male and I don't 
fit all of the male categories or I am rejected by male peers, that must mean I am female. Um, again, and we talked about this potential confounder between the difficulty of differentiating gender from sexual orientation earlier. So what I want to get to is also some of the criticism that's been put out there um, regarding the literature that we've looked at so far. So one of, the, one of the biggest critiques of the literature is that a lot of the overlap between the diagnosis has relied on a single question on the CBCL. So the CBCL is a broad symptom scale um, filled out by parents, one of the questions of which is, does your child wish to be the opposite sex? And the choices are never, sometimes, and often. Never, sometimes, and often. So those are the choices that the parents get. Um, if parents report that the answer is sometimes or often, that is what's typically, that's what has been categorized as having a cross-gender identity. Um, other studies have also made the argument that the rates of gender dysphoria have been similar among a clinically referred population with ADHD. So, Yes, you can make the connection between the overlap of autism and ADHD and go in a circle and figure out that narrative. Um, but it is also to say that, look, maybe the rates are just higher among clinically referred populations. Other studies that have looked at autism symptoms in gender clinics, so heavily rely on the, the SRS and the um, AQ, which again, are screening items and not diagnostic items for autism. Um, multiple, uh, some have argued that psychosocial challenges may be related more to gender dysphoria and the comorbid disor disorders, depression, anxiety, et cetera, which come up and are, are scaled as autism-like traits. And again, the, the diagnosis of autism in any clinically referred population is just going to be higher. One of the other arguments that has been put out there that if we, if we buy into the extreme male brain theory of autism, it doesn't, and gender dysphoria, it doesn't explain um, gender dysphoria in natal males. So if increased testosterone exposure um, is a, leads to a higher incidence of transgender females, it still does not explain the high incidence of transgender males, or transgender male males. Um, what I want us to think of as a group is that regardless of what the literature shows, regardless of what the exact percentages are, um, we need to think about how does this, how do these two diagnoses impact individual ch children's functioning and family functioning? Um, we know that gender identity is an important part of development. Sex is an important part of development. Um, they impact a number of peer relationships, socialization, and we know that gender affirming therapy will increase satisfaction both in lifestyle and with their treatment. We know that early intervention for, for kids with gender dysphoria can reduce the risk of associated psychiatric conditions, which includes anxiety, depression, suicidality, trauma, family rejection. Um, interestingly enough, um, in a, another study that came out in the past month, um, it reported that puberty blockers do not reduce gender dysphoria. So a lot of, it's something that for individuals who work with a lot of trans identified kids, it's trying to figure out how do we balance the, the needs of the child and the support with the parents and the medical treatment. Um, one way that we have as a community thought would be useful would be to introduce things like puberty blockers in which it will delay the secondary sex characteristics, allowing the child to develop a more deep gender identity. However, we know that puberty blockers in themselves do not reduce gender dysphoria. Um, 
I want to point out this article in particular from Strang et al. Um, in 2018 because I think they did a really nice job of recruiting and being thoughtful about studying uh, this particular population. So they did a qualitative study with 22 youth who identified as both having gender dysphoria and having autism and basically asked them a series of questions about what they need and how autism or gender dysphoria impacts their other diagnoses. One of the, th the things, one of the um, ideas or one of the outcomes that they came up with was that the youth felt like there's urgent gender needs. Um, they felt like the imp that medical supports were important and that the medical community played a significant role in supporting and uh, reducing their distress and or impairment from their diagnoses. They talked about the impact of their neuro, neuro, neurodiversity with difficulty, again, describing how they're feeling when they're explaining their narrative of their, their gender jury, communicating, advocating for themselves. Um, they also talked about gender exploration and expansiveness, um, that they, there's a vague awareness of things that fall outside of the gender binary. So there is less awareness about um, gender queer or being gender binary um, as an alternative to either being male or female. They talked about the significant amount of bias and harassment that they, that they experience, um, the discomfort they have in, in expressing their, their gender, and especially worries about being questioned um, because of their autism diagnosis being believed, being believed by parents, being believed by medical providers. This was a huge worry of theirs. Um, but ultimately, another point that came out in a number of the interviews was, was confidence and hope for the future, that they can pursue a, a happy life in their identified gender, and that um, at some point, things would improve for them. Um, in a publication with the same, a similar group, uh, they came out with initial clinical guidelines for, for individuals with co-occurring autism and um, gender dysphoria. And things that they highlighted are that for individuals with autism, it is important to take a thorough developmental history with focus on questions of gender identity and sexual orientation. So in other populations, um, this, this may be something that is glossed over, but particularly for individuals with ASD, um, it is important to ask these questions. It's important to identify both the urgency and areas of distress. We know that individuals who identify as transgender or as non-cisgender, there's a high, high rate of suicidal ideation and lifetime suicide attempts. Um, so assessing the urgency and distress is very, very important. <coughs> and for individuals with gender dysphoria, uh, we need to better screen for uh, developmental social problems and, and ASD. For both populations, it's important to provide uh, both psychoeducation about gender identity and, and identifying as transgender, but also providing a spectrum of gender identities. So again, going back to the previous study, um, many children, especially young children, don't know that there are other options besides being either male or transgender female or transgender, um, when in fact, and a, a number of you have probably observed, there are a number of different gender expressions that, that teens and others and adults are expressing. Um, and a first step, um, in my mind, clinically, is always to encourage gender expression and exploration. Um, oftentimes, when a child comes in in distress, a simple conversation about with parents about, look, we don't have to make a diagnosis of gender dysphoria. We don't have to start hormones tomorrow. We don't have to do all this. How about we just start with allowing the child to explore different gender options and different types of gender expression, whether that be name, whether that be dress, whether that be 
um, how people refer to the child, and even going that far can make a huge difference uh, with the children and their families. Uh, another recommendation was to refer children and, and youth for expert medical evaluation. Luckily here at UCLA, we both have a gender health program and a robust um, clinical service for individuals with autism. So this is less of a concern um, here. However, it, it is useful to be able to have providers who are able to assess for both. Um, particularly if individuals are prepubertal, because again, there's a limited time in which puberty blockers can be effective. And so if we are delaying the medical evaluation too long, we may uh, miss that window. So I wanted to, to bring this up. This was a blog that I read about a writer advocate. Her name is Lydia Brown. Um, actually, I don't know if he, she goes by he, she, uh, they. Their name is Lydia Brown, um, and they basically wrote about their experience as a, what they describe as a gender vague individual. Um, let me open this up a little bit. So Lydia describes being diagnosed with both, uh, both autism and also identifying as gender vague. And I want to use their words because I think it captures a lot of the experience much better than I could ever explain. Um, so they write, so many of us are used to being outcast for our atypical communication, sensory experiences, emotional expressions, and behavior. For some of us autistic people, that constant outsider status makes it easier to figure out that we fall somewhere along the transgender or genderqueer spectrum, since we're already used to not fitting in, or at least it's harder for us to hide outward gender nonconformity. For many of us, gender mostly impacts our lives when projected onto us through other people's assumptions, but holds little intrinsic meaning. Someone who's gender vague cannot separate their gender identity from their neurodivergence. Being autistic doesn't cause my gender identity, but it, but it is inextricably related to how I understand and experience gender. Autistic people's brains are fundamentally different from those of anyone who is assumed to be quote normal or quote healthy, but many, but certainly not all autistic people, but for many, we can't make heads or tails of either the widespread assumption that everyone fits neatly into categories of men and women or the nonsensical characteris characteristics expected or assumed of womanhood and manhood. We deserve movements that recognize and affirm experiences that cannot be separated into trans or autistic issues only, especially given the commonalities of the oppression we face. It's okay to be autistic and trans, and it's okay for those things to be related and overlap. So to finish up, um, so you, in terms of the literature, Youth with autism may be more likely to express both gender identities and sexual orientations outside of the typical binary. Um, trans and gender nonconforming youth with autism may have particular difficulty expressing and exploring their gender identity. Uh, this comes up quite frequently uh, when we see new patients in the gender health program um, because parents may not have any sense that the child identified as, as a gender other than their assigned gender until they vocalized it at age 16, age 17. Persistence, consistence, and insistence of an alternate identity are important. If possible, refer to expert gender clinics and clinicians early. And again, we're only at the beginning of understanding what this broader narrative actually means. Um, I just want to put up a couple of resources. So the UCLA Gender Health Program, um, you can find it on the UCLA main webpage. These are some of the organizations that we interact with frequently and I think are great resources for patients and family. So WPATH is the World Professional Association of Transgender Health. 
they established and set many of the professional guidelines for medical treatment for transgender youth. Uh, Fenway Health is a great resource for parents and individuals and providers. Um, PFLAG is an organization for parents to get information about LGBTQ youth. The LA Gender Center um, is a local resource with many mental health supports. The Trevor Project is a national hotline for LGBTQ youth, um, who a national suicide hotline that includes both a phone and a texting resource, which they have, through their research and data, have found out that transgender teens actually feel more comfortable texting suicide hotlines than calling. So that is an important resource. And then the LA, uh, Los Angeles LGBT Center as well. All right, I'm gonna stop there and pause for any questions. <laughs> questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, so what if it's not the overlap of these things, but it's some sort of disease with the, or position with a different mechanism altogether? So the question is, um, what if it's not just autism and gender dysphoria? What if there's a third or fourth um, presenting uh, phenomenology that we haven't yet captured? Um, I think it's a great question. What I refer back to is, sorry, I'm gonna soup through. So I think that there's probably an infinite amount of categories is the short answer to that. Um, when we look at things like the spectrums of gender identity and sexual orientation, so if we remember back and think about as a corollary, what happened to homosexuality within the DSM and how that progressed and was ultimately eliminated, it shouldn't surprise anybody that there is a current push and a movement to actually remove gender dysphoria from the DSM. Um, it is somewhat a little bit more complicated because of the medical treatment, which needs a diagnosis for billing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but really, when we look at these spheres, it's kind of where as we, we as a society draw the line. And so if we look at the diagnoses for gender dysphoria in kids, these are only diagnoses because we as a society have said that, look, if there's strong, prefer strong preference for playmates of the other gender, that that is atypical. So, as these society beliefs and expectations change over time, um, I expect that you know, it, it could become more rigid, it could become more tolerant. Um, I expect it to become more tolerant, and in that case, you know, maybe a lot of these overlaps will disappear. And there, there's individuals even within the Asperger's and autism community who are saying the same thing. It's, Kind of like, look, if we, there are differences for sure, um, but those differences aren't necessarily pathological or negative. It's kind of where do we draw the line between pathology and normal or typical? What, just to add on to that, what I don't think we, we know quite yet is I anticipate that a huge proportion or a large proportion of children who are identifying either as trans or presenting to medical clinics will over time probably fall somewhere in the middle, which is the non-binary section. And we don't really have clear guidelines on how or what to do medically in order to best support these individuals. So I think that's, that's sort of where I think there's a big question mark. We'll go to Kathy and then we'll 
aborted and you get the the pubertal um, treatment. For you know, I was thinking about that, and one hypothesis, and I'm just throwing this out there um, clinically and anecdotally, um, is that it's, it's really putting a pause for no one else or for everyone else besides the child. So generally, uh, children don't present saying, I want to I be on puberty blockers because I'm not sure and I want time to figure it out. It's typically, I feel different and so I want to progress through this change and providers and families are, are more um, hesitant and saying look this can buy us a little bit of time maybe you'll grow older and make decisions differently which I don't think is inappropriate but I uh, that's kind of my guess of so Fast change to your frustration, maybe. The children or the parents? The, Actually, I was thinking the youth. Kids. The youth, yeah, and you know we 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 do a lot of that, and it's I think the urgency is something that's important because there's some youth that we see um, who you know have identified as trans since the age of 12, mm -hmm. and now they're 17 versus a youth who comes in at the age of 17 who maybe in the past couple of months has started to feel you know, that their identity is somewhat more fluid or that doesn't capture it. Um, so I would answer part of that. Question or comment? I see. So how do the, the, two the question being how do you how do you be supportive and affirming while also pursuing other potential comorbidity and things that might be contributing? Yeah, as a clinician specifically. Um, so I think there's so like Jess was saying, there's a number of steps that that individuals go through and one of them is is social transition which for a lot of youth isn't insignificant it's not ultimately where they they want to be but it but it is a path moving forward and a big part of that is working with the families to understand support validate i mean if you can get the families to support the child and allow the child to express themselves um, more in tune with how they feel. I mean, those two factors alone are huge if those can be done well. And then, uh, you know, on the other side, then you're pursuing all the other medical workups and treatments and, and those types of things. It is tricky, um, especially with individuals who, you know, see things as, you know, the before and after pictures, the before and then the after, and they, and they present and say, I want hormones to look like this. And it, it is much more of a process than some people anticipate. So it's, it's, there's so much that else that needs to be done that hormones are just the one part of it that, that a lot of children fixate on. Um, but you can make a whole bunch of movement with all this other stuff as well. School supports, name changes, all of those. Yes, that is a tricky question. Um, 
I think, I think that's where the expert consultation really comes in because I would, I would want to make sure I am pretty confident in either it being a restricted interest or not to, to really tackle that. And, you know, again, for, whether it is or it isn't, if, if somebody is continuously expressing a non-binary identity, there are ways to support that that are outside of whatever that interest may be. Does that make sense? Uh, look, a, a, another example would be there, so I recently saw a youth that was um, identifies as transgender, um, came in with a very restricted interest around politics and beliefs and how uh, trans identified people are treated mis unfairly and that was sort of their impetus to identify as trans and part of it has been saying, look, we're going to go through all these evaluations. These are the ones I recommend. We are concurrently going to support your gender identity and gender transition while also doing these other steps to make sure that all of these other things are, are, are well managed. Um, and part of that was to say, look, if, if in the end it, it is a restricted interest, then I expect that to either change, morph, or go away over time. But that doesn't also mean that they can't express themselves differently, and parents can try to understand and validate and support. They had a complication when somebody was a youth who was transitioning into adult years, but he is still under their parental guardianship because he has physical disability, which he cannot do a lot of things himself. Yeah. And he cannot abandon his family support because he cannot imagine what life have an outside family. Family is on one hand supportive and another one is not, and they do have a good reasons for it. So it's just complicated quite. And um, what do you? Uh, how do you help? And then the mother got cancer, so it has to be. So it's been dramatic for everybody involved. Um, at what point do you say that you know the parents has to give up? the idea of what he's supposed to or she's supposed to or they supposed to be like? So I think that's, that's a great question. And that's where I would narrow in on what, how much distress is that causing? And how is that related to behavior, problematic behaviors or impacts on the family? Because one thing I didn't mention was um, once individuals, I guess I did kind of mention it, once, once we reach late adolescence and early adulthood, if individuals are still consistently presenting or identifying as transgender, that is likely to persist. And so I can therefore rely on some of the data and say, look, I, I get the fights and the tantrums and all of these. These might be related to both their gender and autism. I don't anticipate their gender to change. So if we're OK with these behaviors, or if we're OK with these ongoing behaviors, then I am OK with that. But I don't expect that to change over time. So there was a supposed disagreement between different providers, because some so as a temporary, and the other so as more, is more persistent. Providers? Mm -hmm. Oh. Uh, because the, the more clinician involved, the number of different yeah. So they will, you know, drop the straw so we will possibly send them over. <laughs> send them over to our clinic. <laughs> we'll see them. Oh. <laughs> yes, that was actually um, one of my referrals, but anyway, we did all this. Thing. Yeah, it's it's, it's tough. A family dynamic, you know, so it's not a problem just with the child. Obviously, it's been going on since we got a child. Right. And, and the, more, the more specific I can narrow down and, and get to what is the behavior coming from, the more I can say a year later, you know, oh, this behavior has continued. Well, we haven't really addressed it yet. So I would expect it to continue and to continue even longer until we address it. Should we address it now or not? All right, I think we have to stop.
Thank you for attending.